The walls of the city of Jerusalem were mere rubble. This news made Nehemiah very sad. So Nehemiah began to rebuild. He led the people day in and day out. Enemies attacked, but they overcame. God helped them finish the work in only 52 days. The Jews who had once been in captivity now returned home. Change your world in 52 days. The story of Nehemiah. Well, hey, everybody, so good to welcome all of you back to week two of our series, Change Your World in 52 Days. And we said last week when we kicked this uh, new series off that our story takes place about 2,500 years ago. And it was during a difficult time in the nation of Israel's history. Uh, they had uh, been uh, for 70 years taken into captivity by the Babylonians, and a, a new empire had emerged, the Persians, that allowed them to return back to their homeland in Jerusalem and Israel, only to find that their, their walls around their city had been broken down. Their gates had been burned by fire. Now, if you're in a city living in those days and you had no walls, you were defenseless. For 70 years, they tried to rebuild the walls that were broken down, and they were unsuccessful. So they're, they're defenseless. They're, they feel defeated and discouraged. And then there's this guy, Nehemiah, who shows up on the scene, and he begins to hear this news of his beloved homeland, and, and his heart is broken to the core about what's happening. And here's what we discovered last week, because listen, if some of you have some things that are broken in your life, if some of you have some things that you've tried to fix, maybe for some months or for some years, and for some reason or another, you just haven't been able to put it back uh, together, like Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall. Does anybody know what I'm talking about, all right? And for some reason, you've been trying to fix something. Fix your finances, fix a relationship, maybe fix your body, fix your mind, your emotions. Fix something that's been broken. And for some reason or another, you haven't been able to put it back together again. Well, we find this guy, Nehemiah, in the same situation. And, and, and last week, we, we said that he was able to fix what was broken in 52 days. He was able to do in 52 days what was unable to get done in 70 years. How did he do that? Last week, we discovered, listen, if you're trying to, if you're trying to change your world, you don't have to be the best. You just need to care the most. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to be the best dad to change your world. You don't have to be the best mom. You don't have to be the best kid. You don't have to be the best uh, business owner. You don't have to be the best student. You don't have to be the best preacher. Don't amen that. Thank you. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to be the best anything to change the world. You just need to care the most. And nobody cared more than Nehemiah. In fact, uh, we're, as we're studying his story here, the book of, of Nehemiah, we're going to learn today that one of the secrets to his success. One of the secrets to his success and your success, if you're trying to change, if you're trying to fix something in you or in your world, here's what we're going to learn today. That, that your private life, that your private life determines the effectiveness of your public ministry. Your private life determines how effective you're going to be in your public ministry. Now, some of you are like, wait, wait, time out. What are you talking about? I don't have a ministry. Like, you're the hired holy guy around here. Like, you have the ministry. Dude, I'm just like, uh, I'm just a guy going to work every day trying to provide for my family. I'm just a stay-at-home mom. I just go to school. I don't have a ministry. I'm not a minister. No, no, no. Time out. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a ministry. I mean, I mean if, if Easter, right, listen, if Easter tells me anything, we just came off, the, we're two weeks off the heels of, of Easter. When Jesus died on the cross, something significant happened in the temple that day. I don't know if you know a little bit of the, the Jewish history there, though. Uh, what happened when Jesus died on the cross in the temple? It says the what? The curtain was torn in two. What would the curtain do? For years, dating back to the time of Moses, there was a curtain that was put up in the tabernacle and then eventually into the temple. It was as thick as, the, as, as wide of a, a man's hand and it separated the priest from the holy of holies. And only one priest, the, the high priest, would go behind that curtain once a year to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people to God. 
But when Jesus died on the cross, it says that the, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. What is the spiritual significance of this? This is really important when we're talking about changing our world. The spiritual significance of this, and, and, and Peter shed some light on this in, in his writing. Peter says this, that, that, when, that temp, when that curtain was torn in two, it now provides everyone free access into the presence of God. It, it provides everyone the ability to minister to God, to offer sacrifices to God. Peter said it this way, we are now living stones that are being built into a spiritual house, right? We are a royal priesthood, a chosen people to offer sacrifices through Jesus Christ, what that means is now that Jesus has died and risen from the grave, there's no longer just a select group of people that get to do the ministry. Everybody now gets to do ministry. It's, a, it's like an all skate, man. It's like, it's like everybody on the floor. So I just want to remind some of you today, we're talking about changing your world, changing something in you or something around you. I just want you to know today that your private life determines your public ministry. Some of you are like, oh, I don't have a ministry, man. I just, you know, I just, I just drive a school bus. No, 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 no. That school bus is your ministry. Well, I just go to work every day. No, that workplace, that's your ministry. I just, ri I, I just, uh, I just run a business. No, that, you don't just run a business. That business, business is your ministry. We say, I'm just a stay-at-home mom. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're raising those kids. Those kids are your ministry. Some of you are like, well, can I get a new ministry? No, I just get <laughs> No, you're stuck with that one. No, listen, no, whatever it is that you do, I'm just a student. I go to school. No, no, that school's your ministry. Listen to me, young person. You have a ministry. Well, I'm just, I'm just retired and I play golf all day. Well, first of all, we all hate you if that's, <laughs> if that's you. No, but I just want you to, listen, if you play golf all day, you know that golf, that clubhouse, that's your ministry. That gym that you go to, you don't just go to that gym, it's your ministry. That neighborhood that you live in, it's not just where you live, it's your ministry. When you see something that needs to change in you or around you, listen, I want you to know, God has, has uniquely gifted you and appointed you for such a time as this. He has determined your steps before you take them to bring change and affect the kingdom of God wherever you are. And in order for you to be effective at that, listen, your private life is going to determine ultimately the effectiveness of your public ministry. Are we all on the same page? Say, say amen, everybody, right? And today, here's what we're going to discover as we continue to study Nehemiah's story together. That nothing will determine who you are. Nothing will shape your, your character and your, 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 your uh, attributes as a man or a woman of God in your private life more than prayer. Prayer and your prayer life will determine and shape mold and form your character, who you are. When no one else is around, prayer will determine and lead and guide and make you into the man or woman of God that he has designed you to be. And today, here's the cool thing about today's message. We get to take a sneak peek into the heart of a world changer, and we get to listen to him as he prays. You know, he, pray, he prays like nine different prayers and he writes them down for us. Today we're going to study one of them. And you know, you can learn a lot about a person by listening to how they pray. That's why whenever I'm around, was, everybody always wants to say, well, pastor, why don't you pray? No, no, no. I'm praying all the time. I want to hear you pray. Because you can learn a lot about a person, what they care about, what motivates them, what drives them, how they think, how they feel, how they see the world, right? Where they are in their walk with God and how they got there by listening to how they pray. So we're going to get to listen in on, and, and, and listen to this world uh, changer pray today. Because here's what I figure. I figure that if we can learn to pray like Nehemiah, we can learn how to change our world like Nehemiah changed his. So I want us to look at basically three questions that will guide us today in, uh, in our walk through, through this chapter of Nehemiah's story. Three questions I want you to think about today. Number one, when should I pray? Number two, why should I pray? And then number three, if you're taking notes, how 
Should I pray? And that's where I want to spend the lion's share of our time together. But let's just kick it off with this first one. When should I pray? Here's the answer. Before I do anything else. This is like really deep, right? Are you with me? Some of you want to go deep in God? Here it is. Ready? Here's when you pray. Before you do anything else, pray. Look what happens here. Nehemiah, remember his brother Hanani comes to him with some of the entourage from Jerusalem to tell him the news. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile, man, they're in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So how's it going? It's not going good, boss. It's pretty bad. It's embarrassing. We're a public shame. He goes on. They said, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and I mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Here's what we're going to learn about Nehemiah. He was a world changer. He was a leader. He was a man of action. He was an influencer. He was a planner. He was a strategist. He was a thinker. He, he, he was an organizer of people. But before all of that, he was a man of prayer. Here's when you pray. Before you do anything else. Here's what we know about Nehemiah. He did a lot of things, but he didn't do anything until he prayed. He didn't do anything until he prayed first. If you want to change the world, here's the deal. You have to do more than pray. But you don't do anything until you pray. Can I get an amen? Listen, there's, there's, you got to put some feet on those prayers, but you got to pray the prayers first. Pray before you do anything else. When he heard this news and it cut him to the core, I mean, it just wrecked his soul. It, 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 he was just so broken over this. And before he, you know, picks up the phone and he calls the bank to see if he can put some money together to rebuild the, you know, walls around Jerusalem, before he starts putting a strategic plan together, before he calls anyone for help, he gets down on his knees before his God and he calls on God first. Listen, if you want God to change your world, you got to begin with prayer because God never does anything great that first doesn't, isn't birthed out of a broken heart that's moved with compassion, that compels us to, to, to pray. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He made prayer a priority. And I just want to encourage some of you today, something needs to be fixed Something needs to change in your world. God wants to use you to bring about change in someone else's world, but it's got to begin with prayer. And I know some of us, will, well, I feel like I'm so busy, I don't have time to pray. Listen, <laughs> I get that. There's always something that's competing for our time and our priority. I get that. There's always something else to do. There's a meeting to go to. There's something to prepare for work. There's, a kid needs a, a, a sandwich made. Uh, somebody needs a ride somewhere. There's always something that's going to be vying for our time. But friends, we need to make prayer a priority. How do you know when prayer becomes a priority in your life? Here's how you know. It's when prayer becomes a first response and not a last resort. That's how you know prayer has become a priority. I, I work with some leaders and I hear some conversations. I work with some people and, you know, they tell me their whole story and what's been broken and how they've tried to fix it. And, and they just kind of go lengthy story of all this stuff. And I said, well, what do you think you should do? He goes, well, I don't know. I guess all we can do now is pray. I'm like, now's when we want to pray. <laughs> like as a last resort, can, can we just flip the script and say, how about, you know, prayer. Here's, prayer isn't like how you hold your hands. Prayer isn't even the words that come out of your mouth. That's not what matters most. It doesn't matter whether you kneel or whether you stand, whether you pace. I'm like a stalker. Like when I pray, I'm just, I'm just pacing. I'm like a caged lion. And I, I okay, it's not, about, it's not about what's going on on the outside as much as what is going on on the inside. Listen, prayer is not a program. It's not, it can't be reduced to some kind of formulaic uh, you know, silver bullet and you just say this or you just do this or you sit like this or you fold your hands like that or you, you know, you say this. No, 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 that's a program. Prayer isn't a program as much as it is, as it is a posture of your heart. Prayer becomes a posture of your heart when it's a first response and not a last resort. It's the first thing you go to 
when you hear good news, thank you, Jesus. It's the first thing you go to. When you hear bad news, come on, let's pray. That's how you know it's, it's a first response. Before you walk into that meeting, Father, give me success as I walk into this room. I don't know what's going to happen. Give me the right spirit. Give me the right attitude. Help me know what to say. Help me know when to be quiet. Give me the right words when I'm talking to my teenage son or daughter. Give me the right words when I've got to confront my husband or my spouse on this issue. Give me the right countenance. See, you open up some mail and you read something, you know, and if it's bad news, instead of just getting upset and throwing a fit right there in the kitchen, what if you just simply would sit down and lower your head in a moment of prayer and say, God, I didn't see this coming, but you did. So I'm going to give it to you in prayer right now. Prayer is more a posture of your heart. It's not a program. Amen? It's not a program. So Nehemiah, he was a man of prayer. So that's when we should pray. How about, how about why should I pray? Here's a few thoughts. Number one, prayer proves that I am depending on God. That's what it proves. You see, when we, when we fail to pray and when prayer isn't a priority in our life, Here's what that shows. It shows that I'm not really depending on God. It's like, I got this. Because here's what prayer does. Prayer flies in the face of self-sufficiency. Prayer by its very nature, it's admitting, I can't do this, so I need help from someone bigger than me, smarter than me, more resources than me to help me in this situation. See, see, when we don't pray, it, it's really like just saying right to God, look, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. But when I do pray, it's proving I, I can't do this. It's an acknowledgement that, God, I need your help. And even Jesus, isn't, even Jesus, who had all power and authority under heaven given unto him, here's what Jesus said in John 15, verse 5. He said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much what? That means you'll be successful. You'll have a harvest, man, in your life. Good things will happen for you if you remain in me and I in you. Um, You're going to be successful. But he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is saying, look, all God is looking for, you don't have to be the best. You just have to be willing to acknowledge, I can't do this without you. Father, I need you. I can't fix this. I can't put it back together. I, I, I can't see it all the way that you see it. So, God, I'm relying on you to give me wisdom and perspective here. And can I just tell you, there is nothing that God won't do for a man or for a woman who fully acknowledges their need of him. There's nothing God won't do. Come on, somebody, give God praise today on this foggy, rainy, icy day in the Poconos. Listen, prayer... Uh, Why should I pray? It lifts also, uh, it lifts a heavy burden. That's what prayer does. Can I just say, look, you're not God and I'm not God. Sometimes we want to feel like we can handle anything. We can't handle everything. We're not, we're weak and broken. We're made from dirt. Goodness sakes, right? And we can't do it on our own. That's why God has given us this wonderful gift called prayer. To help us lift the heavy burdens of life. To help us put it up under our shoulder and move it down the field. When we run out of energy and strength or wisdom or know-how, then we can go to God in prayer. And we can, It's to to me, it's like a big, prayer is like a big decompression chamber. And I can just like download all of the, that's that's where Peter says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Can I tell you, friend, God cares about you. He cares about you. He cares about what you're going through. He sees and he knows and he feels and he hears. Go to him in prayer and you'll feel the sweet presence and the peace of God wash over your heavy soul and help you lift your heavy burden. Come on, aren't you thankful for the gift of prayer today? He didn't wire you to take it on your own. Oh, those that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. Come on, they will walk and not faint. Come on, prayer is going to help you lift the heavy burden. You know what the word Nehemiah actually means? The word Nehemiah actually means the Lord 
is my comfort. Isn't that good? The Lord is my comfort. When you try to change the world, when you try to change some things that are broken in your life, in your world, or in the world around you, I'm telling you, here's what's going to happen. It's going to cause stress. And stress will rip you apart. It's exhausting. It'll, it'll weigh you down. But world changers, they find great strength on their knees in prayer. They find great comfort on their knees. They find the power to face another day on their knees in prayer. So why should I pray? Man, it lifts a heavy burden. Prayer also, you know what it does? It releases the power of God in my life. Prayer releases the power of God in my life life. Prayer, it, it, it allows us to tap into the power and to the endless supply of God's, of God's uh, power that he's made available to us. The great prophet Jeremiah, he said it this way, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Some of you are trying to figure some stuff out. You don't know what your next move should be. You don't know you stand at a crossroads and you're trying to make a decision that's going to have massive implications for your life in the next 12 months, in the next two years, in the next 10 years. And that, that can add a heavy burden and weight and it can drain you. And I know what it's like to have to make big decisions and feel the weight of that burden and the fatigue and what it does to you, not just emotionally and spiritually, but also physically so when I call on God in prayer, he's going to answer me, he's going to answer you, and he's going to tell you things that were previously hidden from you. He's going to help you make the right call. He's going to help you take the, the right path, and he's going to set you up for success. Aren't you thankful for the power that we have through going to God in prayer? Now, here's, here's what I want to talk to you about the most. How should I pray? How should I pray? Um, we have an example here in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 11 of how we should pray. We have an example of a world changer's prayer. Like this example we're going to walk through here in these next uh, 13 minutes. It's going to help us understand here, here's how, here's the kind of prayer that you need to pray in order to change the world. Not specifically in what you say, but the heart behind it. Are you with me? The transcending principles will pull out of Nehemiah's prayer. And here's what all the great prayer warriors understand about prayer. The way to get God to answer your prayer is to give him a really good reason. And whatever it is that maybe you brought into this place today, it's heavy on your heart. That might be weighing you down. The decision you're trying to make. Here's what I just want you just to reflect for just a minute before we jump into these verses 1 through 11. Why should God answer your prayer? That's a really good question to ask, right? Like, why should God answer this prayer? Here's, here's, here's a really good reason. And this is the first principle of praying a world changer's prayer. Number one, when you pray, base your request on who God is. Base it on who God is. Start there. Start your prayer with who God is. Not with what's going on. Not with what he said or she said or what your boss did or the whole, you know, the last 10 years of what's happened to you that's been unfair Let's just start. Are we all are we okay with that? All right. Start your prayer and base your prayer on who God is. Look what he does. Listen, listen to his, how he kicks this prayer off. So I said, oh, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. That means promises. And steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. You see how he starts his prayer? He doesn't say, this isn't right, and why did you allow this to happen? And now the walls, and then there's the fire, and there's nobody can do it, and for 70 years, and this is not. He starts his prayer, oh God of heaven, 
you are great and you are awesome and you keep your promises. He starts his prayer based on not what's going on, but based on who God is. He says this, God, you're great. That speaks of God's position. You're over it all. He says, you're awesome. That speaks of his power. God, there's nothing that you can't do. He speaks of him keeping his uh, covenant. That means, God, you, you're a God who keeps his promises. You've got power, you've got position, and you keep your promises. Let's start there. Here's why you should answer my prayer, God, because of who you are. Because, of God, God, here's why you should answer this prayer, God, because you're faithful. God, because you're good. God, because you're powerful. God, because you're awesome. You're strong. You're mighty indeed. There's nothing that you can't do. God, you're big and you're large. You are in charge. God, I'm coming to you with this prayer because you can handle it. This is big, but God, you are bigger. He goes to God in prayer. He pours out his heart and he says, God, you're powerful and strong and mighty indeed. He acknowledged, God, this is a mess. I get it. It's a mess down there in Jerusalem. But God, you're bigger than this mess. And that's just where maybe where some of you are today. God, this is a mess. Just got those lab reports back. I'm a mess. My HDLs are what? What? They're going to have to do what? I need what procedure? I'm going to miss how much work? You just got your bank statement. I'm like, I owe how much? I thought I was getting money back on my taxes. I didn't think I, I, I was going to, had to pay money. How am I going to get out of this? My finance, God, my finances are a mess. What I did in this relationship is a mess. My, my, my marriage is a mess. My family's a mess. God, whatever. But God, you're bigger than my mess. You're great and you're awesome. You keep your promises. You're faithful, oh God. And I'm coming to you in prayer because of who you are. When you base your requests on God, it, get God, it gets God's attention. Number two, not only do you have to base your request on God, but you got to be honest about who I am. I heard like one or two amens, and I know that amen, and that's a prayer warrior right there. You have to base your request on who God is, but if you really want your request to be answered, you have to be honest about who I am. Look what he says. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people. For four months he prayed this prayer. Before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have sinned. I have sinned. I'm confessing. We've acted very corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. I, do you hear the brutal honesty? You see, when you want God to answer your prayer, you got to base it on who he is, but then you got to be honest about where you are. And he says, God, let me just confess. We really blew it. We messed up. I have sinned. My father's house has sinned. We as a people have sinned. We have blown it. I confess. We've acted wickedly. We have not obeyed. You know, and it wasn't even Nehemiah's fault that his people were taken into captivity. He probably wasn't even born when that was happening. He was probably born during the 70-year period when they were in captivity in Babylon to begin with. Yet he doesn't pass the buck. He doesn't shift the blame. He simply, as a world changer, accepts responsibility. It's not about how he got there. It's the fact that he's there. And he acknowledges the fact that people have dropped the ball. And he doesn't try to blame any. He accepts, he owns where he is. You see, there's a difference between personal confession and national confession. This is a prayer of both personal and national confession. He owns something that he really didn't do because he's a world changer. But then he also confesses for stuff that his whole nation did. And that's hard for us in America and the West to understand because we have such an individualistic mindset, worldview. 
I mean, even in church, even our, our flow of Christianity, we have to confess my personal sins for what I've, and, and that's true, and I get all that. But somebody in the East wouldn't even hardly understand that because they looked at life through a totally different lens where the individual isn't what's most important, the group is what's most important. And so you hear the heart of an Eastern man praying, not just about his personal confession, about we as a people, we've blown it, God. We disobeyed you, God. Corporately, we, we messed up. And this is hard for us to understand here in America. And we just say, well, that wasn't my fault. I didn't do that. No, that's not true. Like one of the things that when I hear people say, well, I just got to do what's best for me. What? That makes me want to puke. We don't just do what's best for me. That's not biblical. It's not what Jesus did. If it was best for Jesus, he wouldn't have went to the cross. No, come on. You are your brother's keeper, are you not? We are the people of God. We don't do what's just best for us. We do what's best for the kingdom of God and for the people of God. And the group matters more than the individual. Because we're all in this thing together. And it's just so hard for us to understand that. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, this is so not even on the radar. When's the last time that you prayed a prayer? God, forgive us as a nation. Like, when's the last time you confessed the sins of your nation in your prayer life? God, forgive us for the racial bigotry of our past and our present. God, forgive us for taking the lives of 40 million unborn babies. God, forgive us for our greed and our avarice. God, forgive us for how we've treated the alien. God, forgive us as a, as a, as a nation for how we've turned our back, how we've done things as a nation, wicked and corrupt against you. God, please have mercy on us as a people to Get it right. God, bring us to our knees and we confess our sins before you. See, when's the last time we prayed like that? When's the last time I prayed like that? It's just really hard for us in, in this. And I get it because I've grown up in the same culture as you. But we can learn from Nehemiah today that national confession is just as powerful and important as personal confessions. So the point is when we sin, here's the deal. We ultimately sin against God. Even, even David, who sinned against Bathsheba, remember when he prayed his prayer of confession? I think it was in Psalm 51. He said, against you and you alone have I sinned. Now, did he sin against Bathsheba? Of course he did. Did he sin against her whole family? Yeah, of course he did. But ultimately, all of our sin is really against God. So we need to go to God and seek him and his forgiveness. And you know, here's the deal. The older I, I become, in my walk of faith, the more increasingly I am aware of my own sinfulness and God's graciousness towards my sin. See, and if you want to pray a world-changing prayer, first, I have to base my request on who God is. Second, I need to be honest about who I am. Number three, I need to remind God of what he said. Now, now, hold on, because some of you think that that's arrogant. It's not arrogant, because all the great, Moses did this, Abraham did this, all the fathers of the, the, uh, of the faith did, prayed this prayer. We've got to remind God, what he, look what he does. Look what he said. He, remember, that's his next part. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you, everybody say that with me. If you are unfaithful, say it with me. I will. Say, if you. I will. Say, if you, I will. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. So this is what the prophets have been saying for generations. God said, listen, I'm going to bring you to this promised land. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide for you. It's going to be great. If you walk in obedience, I'm going to bless you. But if you turn your nose at me, if you just want to do your own thing, I'll remove my blessing, and you'll have to suffer the consequences. Remember, he says, but if you return. So now even if you suffer the consequences, even if you mess up, even if you've really blown it royally, this isn't just for the people of Israel. Come on, this is for the people of Poconos right now. Come on. This is for the people that are in this room that are watching right now online. This is for you. So even if you've blown it, 
And you're suffering the consequences. Here's the good news today. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though you're outcasted in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. He says this, even if you've messed it, even if you've messed up and if you've missed God's best plan for your life, if you'll just confess and turn and you'll come back to me, I will gather you together once again under my covering and my power and protection and, and provision. But we just need to remind God. God, you said this. If you do this, I'll do that. If you do this, I'll do that. So we did all that. We messed up. Now we're coming back. Oh, God, remember what you said. If we come back, you'll be faithful and you'll gather us together. Now, listen. Does God need to be reminded of what he said? Mm-mm. God doesn't need to be reminded. Who needs to be reminded? We need to be reminded. Because sometimes when we screw up and we're discouraged and the devil's doing a number on our mind, we can start thinking pretty bad thoughts. We can forget. It gets cloudy. So we need to remind ourselves of the promises of God. And we got to claim the promises. of. Did you know there's over 7,000 promises that are in Scripture that God says, if you do this, then I'll do that. If you do this, then I'll do that. And I want you to know, the more you know the promises of God, the better your prayer life will be. Amen? Because you can just start rehearsing and going over the promises of God and reminding him of what he said. That's the strength of my prayer life is determined by how well I know the promises of God. Last of all, we need to expect great things from God. Come on, somebody. When you pray, you're calling on a great and an awesome and a powerful and a faithful and a loving God. And so when you pray to a God like that, you ought to expect great things from him. Look what he says. I love how he wraps up his whole prayer. One little thing is all he says. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. So here's his request. Ready? Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Remember, he's going to stand before the king. And he's going to ask of the king, I need a three-month leave of absence. I'm your, like your right-hand guy. I'm your personal protect. I'm the cupbearer. I'm your personal bodyguard. I'm your prime minister. I'm running the whole organization. You're the face of the organization. I'm running it. But here's what I need to do. I need three months off. I need to go rebuild this other nation, get them back up on their feet again. I need millions of dollars from you to do that. Oh, and by the way, God could once again raise them up as a powerful nation on the planet, and they could potentially overthrow you in the future. That's what he's asking for. And he knows that this could be the death of him. But he prays this prayer. God, give me favor. And God, give me success as I stand before the king. So my question for you is, are you praying for success? Some people think, oh, I, I just ought to leave it in God's hands. He's just going to do whatever he wants to do. Can I just say, listen, you need to pray for success. It's okay to pray and ask God to make you successful as long as you use that success not for your glory, but for his glory. You, the motivation of the heart is what makes all the difference when you pray for success. So I'm just encouraging you, pray for success. Because if you don't pray for success, what, I mean, what's the alternative? Pray for failure? Oh, okay, yeah, God, just make me a loser. You know? I just want to be a miserable failure for the rest. For what, no, what's the No, we should pray for success. Pray boldly before the throne. Come before God with anticipation, expecting Him to hear and move on your behalf and perform a miracle for you. And I, can I just say this? If you can't ask God to bless what you're doing, then maybe you're not doing what you need to be doing. If you can't pray to ask God to bless your plans and your success in whatever it is that you're doing, maybe you need to be doing something else. So he prays, oh God, give me success. And this prayer, I believe, in all my heart has evolved over four years. I'm sorry, over four months. Remember he said, I've been praying for, for some time. He started praying this prayer in Kislev 
the month of Kislev, like November. And then it was in the month of Nisan that he goes before the king. So we know there's a four-month window there. And the prayer started like this. Wait, what, what happened, Han and I? It's the walls are broken? And, and, and the people are discouraged? And they're defenseless? <sighs> Somebody should do something about this. And he starts to go with God in prayer. God, somebody should do something about this. That's like the first month. Then the second month, he's praying, God, the walls are broken down. People are in ruins. It's, it's embarrassment because they represent you, and we're a laughing stock of all the nations. God, somebody should do something about this. God, do you think, are you, do you want to involve me? Is this why they came? To now in the fourth month, here's this prayer. God, not s something should be done. Do you want to use me? Now, God, make me a success and go in rebuilding what has been broken down. And when you pray that kind of prayer, that of all, listen, it's a prayer. It, it, it's a prayer of, of conviction. God, you're great. And there's nothing you can't do. It's a prayer of confession. God, this is who you are. You're great. But this is who we are. We've blown it. We're, we're sinful and we're unholy. But it's also, it's also a, a, a prayer of, of confidence that, God, you keep your promises. You stand by your word, but it's, it's also a prayer of commitment. God, give me success so I can go and rebuild what has been broken. And gang, if we can learn how to pray that way, we can do everything that God has called us to do. And that's my prayer for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you today for speaking to us through this 2,500-year-old prayer that you are teaching us how to pray. That I'm even reminded uh, of the disciples as they walked with your son Jesus, as they saw him perform miracle after miracle after miracle, as they listened to him preach, as they listened to him reason with people, as they listened to and watched him walk on water, as they listened to him pray and seek your face, Lord, as they spent three years with Jesus when it came down to it they only asked him one question Lord teach us how to pray but they didn't say teach us how to preach they didn't teach us how to do miracles teach us how to cast out demons teach us how to walk on water Lord teach us how to pray Father almost that if we can learn how to pray we can learn how to do everything else you've called us to do so God, we, with an open heart today, we, 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 we come before you and say, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray, God. Teach us how to seek your face. We come before you and even collectively right now, we confess our sins before you on an individual basis. And Lord, even right now as your people seek you in this moment of quiet reflection, as they, as they seek your forgiveness right now, Lord, may you just wash over them with your sweet grace and forgiveness. Even corporately as a church, Lord, we confess our sins before you, of our nation, of our church. We ask you, God, for your grace and your mercy to be poured out over us. If we failed you, God, help us to, to get it right. If we've ignored problems that are right here in our own world here in Monroe County, oh God, forgive us and give us now wisdom and insight to go and change the world. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Everybody said.